like a chance to answer it. Could, could we maybe just give me an opportunity to have a great captive oh, audience? Yeah, good. Yes. Hey everybody, Greg, welcome. Thanks, Miles. Good to be here. And great to have uh, Team 2 from Auckland, obviously, and uh, John from uh, from my team. So, um, uh, I'm not quite the head of uh, Tatani Padiki, I'm the Director of Partnerships. So the way we structure is we've got an Executive Director, Angela Brazier. I report to her, so she's the head honcho for uh, Auckland's Farms. Uh, I lead the Partnerships Directorate. We've got a Change Directorate, Business Services Directorate, and an Operations Directorate. The Operations Directorate, uh, probably who you have to deal with their staff most often, um, such as Kevin uh, and Andrew, around um, due course, the registry, and licensing and permitting and uh, endorsements and things like that. So what I'll do is I'll just do a quick uh, bit of a, a summary of some key, key stuff, and then absolutely cover any questions or queries that you have. You're welcome to record it, you're welcome to share the recording, um, and what I can't answer, I'm sure the team will cover, be able to cover off. Uh, and if not, we'll find the answer and, uh, and share, it, uh, share it back through. <laughs> so look, the uh, Firearms Registry Camera is a result of the uh, Arms Amendment Act 2020, which uh, came into law in uh, June. Uh, there was a three year period for it to be uh, made available, which is uh, Saturday week on 24 June uh, 2023. Um, one of the key questions that we uh, get from the community um, is what about my privacy and data security? Um, obviously a really big question and, and important for you and important for us as well. So I'll cover that in several ways. From a technical uh, build point of view, because as you can appreciate, uh, we've had a whole lot of very capable technical people working to build the registry, um, is that it's been delivered to the government standards of uh, privacy, information security. We do a whole lot of things called penetration testing, which is effectively they bring in an independent crowd to come in and try to hack it. Um, it's met all the relevant standards and got the sign off. But in addition to that, obviously all of our staff are cleared and vetted. Um, and only those, and obviously standing rules and business processes within Tatari Pariki and indeed police um, are such that people can only access information that they have to do for a genuine work purpose. In addition to that, um, we have uh, assurance and quality assurance going over the top of that. So what that means is that there's general assurance processes uh, and quality processes. The assurance aspect says that on a periodic basis, uh, people would come and say, um, look at what I've accessed, why I've accessed it, um, you know, what I've done with the information uh, and the like to make sure that it's all within in the rules. You know, uh, from an endorsement holder point of view, uh, we've held your information for as long as you've been an endorsement holder. You know, who you are, where you live, all the guns that you've got because um, it's been sitting in our national intelligence application. So now we're just, it's just coming over into a different, uh, different system. So there's a whole lot of layers in addition to the technical uh, specs um, around the data and privacy uh, security. In relation to the tech build, um, we're delivering it in iterative chunks. So the first one's Saturday week, um, and that will enable license holders to be able to come in, uh, create their profile, register their firearms, and carry on business as usual. I'll come back to some detail uh, around that later. Um, in the you know, 12, 18, 24 month period after that, we'll deliver some additional functionality within the uh, registry, and that will enable um, uh, enhanced user experiences uh, for people to be able to go in, uh, move things around, transfer them to people in a simple way, very much like you um, do with your uh, bank account. Um, just briefly on bank accounts, um, as you can, uh, a good analogy to draw with the data on privacy security we've got with the registry is the same as what you do with your online banking. So that's the same sort of. Um, Typical uh, security that's uh, in place. Um, in relation to um, uh, collectors specifically, uh, as you're probably all aware, we have what's called a national intelligence application. It's got your, like I said, it's got your details and all your guns and stuff in it. Like that system was never designed to actually hold all that stuff, it was a couple on. And what's happened is the way that we've recorded all your information in there, like your guns, and you know your guns much better than I ever would, but you know, make, model, serial number, other features. Uh, so on. Um, the data setting over here in the registry is slightly different as is required by um, what's come out in regulations. So in regulations we need to put in the make, the model, uh, the action, the calibre, the type of firearm it is, whether it's a pistol or a restricted weapon, whatever it might be. Um, 
magazine and things like that. And so it's actually not a tidy data fit. So in due course, when you um, come to uh, have to register uh, the things that are in your uh, possession, um, you will actually have to do that because in regulations it says the license holder in possession of the things has to do the registration. So someone can't do it on uh, your, uh, your behalf. So we won't be lifting up the, the NIA information and bringing it over the registry, we'll need to, to later. One of the things in relation uh, uh, to the registration process is a five year period for um, the registry to be fully populated uh, by all license holders. Uh, the, during that five year period, you can come in any time you like and uh, undertake the registration process. Uh, it's easy for someone like myself, I've only got two 22s at home, pretty straightforward process. Maybe some of you have got quite large collections. That's obviously going to be quite a lot of work and I'll cover that um, in due course. But um, during the five year period, there's um, a thing in regulations called an activating circumstance. Um, the activating circumstance means that when you as an individual license holder or myself, we undertake that activity, there's then a time frame associated to how long you've now got to register all the firearms in your position or arms items as well, such as prohibited magazines, to be an example. Um, so those activating circumstances are things like uh, applying for a licence, uh, applying for an endorsement, uh, permit to import, permit to possess, uh, changing your address and things like, uh, like that. So when that activating circumstance takes place, so let's say um, in say 20 days time from now, I uh, apply for a new license. I've then got a 30 day window to uh, register the 222s that I've got. There's two options for registration of, uh, of the arms items that you have. Uh, the first and preferred option is an online option, which is available 24 uh, seven. And it can be accessed through our website, uh, through My Firearms, you've got a registry tab there. Um, the second option, uh, is an 0800 call centre number um, and the likes of Andrew over here, he runs one of the two centres that uh, manages both those, uh, both those pieces of capability. The 0800 number is available Monday to Friday uh, 8 till 4, no sorry, 8.30 to 4.30, uh, it's a Monday to Friday offering. But again, the online is the preferred uh, option. If you do ring the 800 number, uh, you'll be asked some security questions, make sure that you are who you are, uh, and then the team will help you there. In relation to the online uh, option, uh, because it's available 24 seven, there's, there's increased uh, flexibility with that, and that's where I'd encourage you to go to do your registration. So what would happen is you go online, if you don't already have a, a Realme profile, you can just do the unverified Realme uh, process, um, because that's a requirement of government that we, people come in through that channel. Um, you, part of what you do is you enter your, uh, your phone number, your mobile phone, you get pinged a unique identifier, you then put that in. So in my case I'd go to Michael John McElraith, put in my unique identifier and I'd upload the firearms that I have. So I'll put in some information about where I live, um, we'll re re back check that on, across with what we've got in there. And, uh, and then load the firearms, or if I have no firearms or arms items, I would just hit a declaration, I've got nothing, uh, submit that, and I carry on. Because there's a reasonable number of license holders around the country who probably don't have uh, firearms at a particular point in time. Um, having uh, registered those, uh, those firearms, um, in my case, uh, what, can, uh, what can happen is I just carry on and do my normal bunny shooting, whatever it is that I want to go and do with my arms items. Um, the activating circumstance is a one-time only activity that I have to actually go into the registration. I've got an ongoing obligation to make sure the registry stays current from, from my perspective as a license holder. Um, having done the registration, uh, while I'll get confirmation of registration, I won't be able to see what I've registered. In order for you to see what you've registered, um, that's our next tick delivery and also you need to be verified. One of the reasons you need to be verified is that um, the data and privacy security is critical, right? So what I will have to do, uh, I'll have to take my firearms license, my driver license or passport, go to the police station, and there'll be a process there where I'll be given another, oh, they'll verify my identity, they'll check 
you know, obviously the identification that I've provided, they'll check our system, uh, NIA, and then they'll give me a unique code. So when I come back, I can log it on. At that point, very much like your bank account, I'll be able to uh, go and look at what I've got. And as we deliver further functionality, I'll be able to transfer things. So as an example, if John wanted to buy, uh, buy my Ruger 1022 and I wanted to sell it to him, I grab uh, his license number, I have him logged into my system, I put in his license number and say I want that Ruger 1022 to go to John and push it to John. John would go to the system on his phone or laptop, whatever, and go yes. Or you could ring up and do it over, uh, via the 0800 number. Um, so there's a few moving parts there, but obviously there's a whole lot of security features that we want to have, have in uh, place. Particularly for yourselves as collectors, um, you have to, going to have to appreciate that you know guns really well, right? Um, and you've probably got some quite unique stuff. As Andrew and his colleague down in Wellington stand up their registry teams, we've got a whole lot of people who we're providing a whole lot of really good training for, but only a limited number of them have, have a really a, a detailed knowledge uh, of firearms. That knowledge will grow. Um, but in the initial stages, you're going to have to work with us as we uh, populate, uh, populate the registry. What I would anticipate in the future, and one of the things to make sure this is um, more likely to happen, is we'll work with different community groups um, to understand the functionality needed uh, to make uh, the service offering uh, a lot smoother than it has been in years gone by. So in the context of the register, as you know from a long time, we've done a lot of paper. We've recently got the PDF forms. Yep, I know they're long, be with us, that'll change. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of paper. We're not doing any paper process around the registration, right? Because we don't want to have my name, my address, all the guns that I've got, and all this sort of stuff on a piece of paper floating around anywhere. So there is only the 800 number for the, uh, the online option for registration, and therefore then operating in the, um, in the registry thereafter. One of the advantages of online and on, on, or phone number if you choose to do so is the availability. And obviously if someone can't use online, then the 800 number is, uh, is available, or people might be able to, you know, general coverage, wherever it might be. Um, we certainly recognise that there's a lot um, connected around PIMS import, PIMS to possess and stuff like that, and there's some really great technical off offerings that will come in later uh, uh, releases that will uh, streamline processes so you don't necessarily have to go down to Kevin's office to do things on paper as you do now to get a permit to, you know, possess, you know, the Thompson submachine gun from whoever it is in your cohort that wants to sell it. Um, so I think there's going to be some really great, uh, great opportunities uh, there. <coughs> While we're the regulator, and we are, we do provide a service, <coughs> and we probably would all recognise that services in past years has been uh, pretty challenging. There's a whole lot that's behind that, legislation, funding, understanding, all those sorts of things. We've certainly got the funding, we've certainly got a lot more uh, staff on board and coming on board, and upskilling. And so as time goes on, I'm really confident um, you know, things will really improve. A quick example of that would be, uh, 18 months ago, you know, we had nearly 10,000 license applications in the pipeline, and just over 5,000 of those uh, were um, quite dated, you know, like in excess of 120 days old, you know, waiting to go through the licensing process. Uh, as of today, that uh, backlog's totally removed um, and gone, and 80% of license applications in the pipeline at the moment are dealt with in under 90 days. Yeah, so that's really encouraging um, uh, fact around you know uh, the changes that have been uh, been able to be made um, across the regulatory system. So very briefly in the regulatory system, so uh, we remain part of police, and that commissioner of police remains responsible for uh, all things under the Arms Act. There's two key components of that. There's constabulary activity that happens over here in Chasers Crooks with guns, and over here to Tari Pariki. We're the branded and separated business unit that is responsible for the regulatory activity, licensing, permitting, if appropriate revoking, stuff like that. We operate under a 4E principle of engage, educate, uh, encourage, and if required, we undertake regulatory uh, enforcement. Um, we're obviously, uh, and you appreciate you've probably seen it over the years, we're very much a uh, build while you fly as well. So we bring on new capability. It's great to have the likes of as an example, John, you know, collector background, dealer background, all these sorts of things, it brings in a whole lot of fresh knowledge and speaks a language that uh, um, you would understand a lot better than I about some of the detail around different firearms and, uh, 
and so on. So I've, um, I'll sit down shortly and take questions. If I was to summarise it from a collective point of view, come the 24th of June um, this year, so I don't know, it's 12, nine, nine or 10 days away, um, carry on doing what you're doing right now. Um, until you have an activating circumstance, when you have an activating circumstance, you're going to have to register the things you've got um, in your possession. Now, recognising that you're a collective cohort, and I've seen some pretty big, pretty big collections around the country over the last couple of years, and um, it's pretty clear to me in the 30-day window to register your things, uh, there's some people that aren't going to be able to do necessarily put all things in in 30 days, okay? In that scenario, where you've genuinely got a big collection, let's face it, we can look in there and we'll know whether you've got a big collection or not. Um, if you've made a genuine and reasonable effort to get the bulk of that collection into the registry in the, in the 30 days, we'll give you an extension to get the rest of it in. Clearly, if you haven't had, if you haven't made a genuine effort, uh, and you're dragging the chain a bit, then there's a conversation to be had about, you know, um, get it in there, what, what does that look like? We want to work with you to get it in, we want to make the registry successful. Um, in most cases, once you've um, engaged with the registry, the most license holders, um, they probably won't need to touch it again in any meaningful way other than keep address up, change of address updated in ways. Endorsement holders, you're going to be a little bit different. As soon as you apply for a permit um, or things like that, you know, the interactions uh, with the registry. I would really encourage you off the back of tonight's conversation to go and look at our website. Just go into a search engine, Google maybe, Firearm Safety Authority, it'll take you to the Tari Pariki website, go to the Registry tab. There's a wealth of information there. There'll be more information there from Saturday week as well. We've spent a lot of time working with different community members and groups, and we've got a comprehensive list of uh, questions and answers in detail and stuff uh, there. I can't, I've never put my hand in my heart and say we've answered every question, because that's always fraught with danger. And I'm sure there'll be questions out there, and if we learn these questions we haven't got, we can update it as well for you. Um, it is a change for New Zealand um, that we're moving into a full registry for all things. It's less of a change in context, probably, for endorsement holders who um, had a higher level of security for checking um, and requirement about recording their things in years gone by. But the opportunity for endorsement holders such as yourself uh, is the lab of uh, technology deliveries where we can uh, improve the service, uh, service offering. Anyway, thanks for letting me have an initial spiel and um, sort of welcome questions and all feedback. Okay, okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to run through the questions that you've all submitted. I'll read them out and Michael um, speak to them. Okay. Um, so the first question is for park rangers and conservation staff who use communal firearms for their work, who is the principal that needs to register said firearms? The person that stores the firearms or the council that owns them? Yep, so uh, in the context of DOC, DOC are um, exempt from the registry until the Commissioner of Police and the CE of DOC agree that that activity will uh, take place. So initially um, DOC is set to by one side. So if I talk in the context of a regional council, um, they will probably have some guns that are actually the possession, or sorry, the property of um, that regional council because they own them and they're on their books as an asset. Uh, nonetheless, um, they employ license holders to undertake pest control activity. It's the license holder that's in possession of the item that has the responsibility to register the item because the Arms Act does not uh, recognise um, ownership, it recognises possession only. So that so the businesses will have to come to decisions about uh, registration. Obviously they've then got some overheads about when that employee leaves, transfer the registration to another employee that's remaining with the licence. Okay, um, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. Does that, do people understand what that means? Put your hand up if you do. Good, great. Yes, it still doesn't necessarily answer um, who's in possession of things if they're stored, say, in the, in the premises of the council or the top rather than in the individual employees. <coughs> yeah, well, I mean, obviously, the organisation that needs to have controls in place that only licensed staff have access to the secure storage and make, continue to make sure that those staff remain. Uh, license, so you can use the lock online license check to validate on relevant frequency around the license. Um, probably in most cases, that sort of uh, systems and processes are in place. Um, it's my understanding, I couldn't say it is everywhere. Um, but you know, they've got high health and safety overheads they need to meet as well, so 
you know, uh, and if those things aren't in place, we'll work with individual groups or organisations. Okay, and this second question is the second part. If work firearms are registered to a particular person, but are used by multiple users in a security audit, audit for example, what is the time frame given for the registered person to produce the firearm? Yep, so um, there's provision in the Act, so if I move away from endorsed firearms, because it doesn't apply here, but for standard non prohibitive firearms in the work context, or even in the recreational environment, uh, there's a 30 day uh, window where the registry doesn't need to be updated. So I borrowed John's 308 to go uh, deer hunting, and um, he and I are both registered firearms we have. Uh, I'm allowed to take it and he doesn't have to update the registry. If I'm borrowing for more than 30 days, then he needs to update the registry. In this scenario, John can update the registry in a lesser time frame if he chooses to do so, but there is no requirement to do so. If in that 30 day loan period, um, the, uh, John's contacted by Tatari Pariki or police and asked about the particular firearm, he would say, well, I've loaned it to Mike and here's Mike's detail. I've just got an extra question that came to mind while you're talking, Mike, but perhaps Andrew can answer it. How long will the 0800 number run? So, I mean, we've got an 0800 number set up for the registry. For the registry, yeah. Well, as far as I know, as long as the registry exists, we'll have the 0800 number. Okay. But we're encouraging everybody to do it online, so it'll be the, it's the easiest and simplest way of doing it, uh, and, and speediest way, because then you can do it in your own mind. Okay, and the next question is, what modification of a firearm constitutes a trigger event? Changing a scope, for instance, what is the modification? Modification would be uh, changing the calibre, perhaps, um, having it re-serial numbered, um, but putting a new scope on or getting a trigger, trigger done or something like that wouldn't. It would be how long it would stay at the gunsmith would be a triggering event. So if it's at the gunsmith for less than 30 days, then um, uh, it's unlikely that would be a triggering event, but if it's going to be longer than 30 days at the gunsmith, uh, then that would end up being a triggering event because the gunsmith would have then taken possession of the firearm and have to take the, the firearm uh, into the air or, or, or register it against their name. Cool. Yeah, so just a thought there, what about if someone's got one of these blazers that's got five different caliber barrels? How are you going to cope with that? So I'll have to choose one barrel, one caliber to register it at because you can only have one barrel on at one time, on a blazer, and the serial number on a blazer is not a barrel anyway from the memory, it's actually on the receiver. Okay. Can I just touch on something? Yep. So there's, um, there's a requirement to register major parts in the registry, and so that doesn't include your scopes and suppressors and you know spare triggers and stuff like that. Um, check our website, but it's the, um, it's the receiver, the upper and lower receiver, uh, the frame of the pistol, uh, a caliber conversion kit. Yep. If it if, if, if it has a receiver part with it and not yep. serial number part with it. Yep. So there's just a few major parts um, and things like prohibited magazines that go into the uh, registry. But if you've got a standard bolt action hunting rifle with a detachable magazine, we have no interest in the magazine uh, itself. So barrel really Sorry. Barrel really Barrels aren't required. No, it's just the action. Okay, next so question. Just, just oh. second, sorry, just, I didn't realise you're going to have another question. Mm -hmm. Just back to the transferring ownership, say if you've got a gun and you don't need to do this. Uh, uh, the modification that took greater than 30 days, can that be transferred automatically? It's not an issue, you don't have to go through any, if you just register and put it on my um, licence, or I put it on his licence. Yep, so, so if no one else is involved, it's just a normal do this. No, it, it, no, there's always going to have to be license holder involvement. So initially any transfer will be done. After you do your initial registration, if you're doing a transfer, you'll have to ring Andrew's team on the I-800 number for them to do it until we deliver the next tranche of functionality, or the tranche of functionality mm -hmm. that enables you to do it online and at your own pace. When's that due? Uh, we'll get uh, next Saturday done first, and we'll deliver well, the rest. Of it plan. We'll deliver it as soon as we're technically able. Okay, I'm going to move on. How do I load 
My rifle in the register, when every number and inscription on it is either in, and here are some common ones, Nepali, Turkish, Farsi, Siamese, Cyrillic, scripts. You will have to renumber your firearm with a serial number or marking oh, for the legible. So just come yeah, to that. pause. The um, so the bulk of new farms that come into New Zealand. Uh, oh, sorry, all new farms that come into New Zealand have manufactured serial numbers, and I get it. You don't have all of those. So John's dead right. If uh, outside the collector world, I'll come back to the collector world at the moment. If you have something that has something which we can't read, so you know normal numbers and English characters, then you have to have that, and there'll be a guide document released um, probably next week which will give you an indicator on how to select your own serial number and guidance on how to uh, apply it to the, uh, to the firearm. In the context of collectible items, because we don't want to devalue it, but we still need to market, there are particular options. And if you read the guidance document when it comes out, likely the end of next week, you'll be able to see what those, uh, those couple of options are. Okay, their internal uh, marking, where it's uh, less obvious, uh, but still on a significant part of the firearm, such as the action, um, or in a limited number of potential cases, um, some sort of tagging system. But there'd have to be uh, quite unique circumstances for the latter, but the internal marking would be quite acceptable. Rarity or what? You know, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, historical value. Yeah. So everything will be done on an individual basis, on a case-by-case -case basis, evaluating the story, understanding why, and, and because if we have a, a blanket rule out there, then if you have a blanket rule, people abuse it. And if you have a, um, if, you, if you have, if it's done on an individual basis, and you say, look, I've got this really, really rare firearm here, <clears throat> and we go, yeah, right, yeah, we understand that it's a very rare firearm, yeah, we're going to take that into consideration. So who do we engage to do that? Is to do that by phone or online? It's going to be impossible. No, so what will happen is um, you'll get you'll phone it into the registry um, and then we'll report it as a, as a task for us to deal with and then that'll go to arm, an arms officer and we'll work through that process. In, the, in the 30 days? days. Oh, well, <laughs> I lost myself even, even better than that. So um, yeah, that'll be well within the 30 days is what we're aiming at. So, but we don't know what's in the land might. Um, and if it goes beyond that, um, you know, we have to be practical because uh, we don't know what it's going to land like um, and, um, and apply it on a case-by-case -case basis, as they say. So for what could be one person could consider it to be, you know, very valuable and you get into another, it's a pretty personal thing, right? So if the gun's worth a million dollars, is that fine that this guy's worth a thousand? Is it an explanatory? So again, that's, we'll take, deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, do people feel that that, uh, that has answered the question about your firearms that have got Farsi, Nepalese, or any other markings on it, just show of hands so we can see. Has that answered the question? Not really. Okay, we're going to move on. I'm going to give direct feedback to these guys sitting up here so that they can see how happy or not we are with the answers, okay? Yeah, they'd be not. <laughs> All right, next question is, what number do firearms owners use when there may be up to three numbers on the receiver? And this I'm talking about is specifically in the case of old military rifles. And we all know um, we're talking about, say, 303s or Mausers. Lugas. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm in that situation myself with some of my 303s where I've got multiple serial numbers on them. Uh, the one I'm going to choose to register with is the most prominent number on there. On the action. On the action, yes, on the action. But there could be three on the action. Could be, yep. So you just pick one? Well, I've got to choose one, yeah. so I can either choose one, um, or I could choose to deface the other ones, which I'm not going to do, because they're part of the, yeah. the gun. True. So I'm going to choose the most prominent number on there. Okay. That brings me, I just would wonder what happens when you go to transfer it, and then the next person tries to use the other number, and then the other thing, and you know, yeah. where does it all end up there? Yes. Yeah. Look, we've gone through this, we've had discussions about this, we've, we've racked our brains, and there's no simple solution to it. Is that unless we actually make people to face the firearm by removing the other serial numbers, and I don't think anyone in this room wants that to happen. Correct. So we're trying to take a pragmatic approach. Are you using a secondary generating number? In what respect? Well, 
say I track a lot of guns and I generate a number that sticks with that gun, right? Yep. And that way you've got two ways of checking it. Right? You know, a car doesn't just have a license plate. Yes. It's, it's multiple numbers, you know. So when you go, oh, I've got three guns and got the number five, but none of them have got X, Y, two, one, six, right? At this stage, no. Okay. No, it's unique if you sorry, this is unique if you fire me fire. Ah, sorry, I mean registry. So yeah, um, if we we're, we're pretty confident that a duplicate isn't going to happen uh, very often, um, and then we'll then it will happen. We hope it But once again, yeah, hell of a lot over about two million guns. Hopium's uh, very it's, addictive. It's so it'll, again, case by case basis, because remember the object of the exercise is to identify the buyer. <laughs> and there'll be ways that we can do that with distinct markings and, and, and differentiate it in the owner. So that's what that's all we're trying to achieve, we're just trying to identify the buyer. Okay, so that's the answer to the question. Everybody understand? Stick your hand up if you know what you got, what's going on with multiple firearms and you're happy with that answer. Hoping and praying. We're not getting a good response. Going right on with your point there, Andrew. <coughs> what description is to be used in the case of an owner not knowing the rifle make or model? For example, many sporterized military rifle owners may only know they have a 303 or a Mauser. So that, uh, again, what uh, the, the plan is, we, if we get to a case like that, we're going to, we're going to We'll take in the initial information um, that'll get stepped up into our arms officer's space and then they'll go back to the, the owner and we'll work through the process and try and identify it um, correctly. One of the opportunities we have is we can seek a photograph from, from you so you can send it, we can then send to someone who's quite, uh, can help us with that um, or as Andrew said, get someone to come out and try to understand what it, uh, what it is. Okay. Sorry, yes, question. So you've got a spoilerized Nalza that's had a scope put on it, you can't even read what's on the banner. What happens then? Do you just file it to the arms officer? And so as a Morsa collector, um, no, you will identify it as a Morsa 98, a Morsa 95, a Morsa 93, or so on and so forth. No. And that and it would be a Morsa, say, say it would be a Morsa 95 Sporter, that would be sufficient. Sweet. Does everyone feel happy with that? If you yeah. feel happy, stick up your hand. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. So this question directly affects a lot of us. So in the example of three registered rifles that you have bought and then stripped to make one good one, what is the procedure for changing the registration categories of the remaining two receivers? So in other words, you've taken three rifles, made one good one, so you've got two leftover receivers. Yep. So a receiver is an arms item in and of itself. Receivers and actions have always been um, required to have, if you're selling from a retail store, they have the serial number. Do you understand that when you agree? Mm -hmm. Yep, right. So the requirement has to be something, right? Yeah, it's that's right. It has to be something, right? So um, <coughs> it's still, if it's just a bare action, if they, for instance, it's a Remington 700 action, then that would be, that would be recorded as a Remington 700. The fact that it doesn't have a caliber, uh, or anything else attached to it um, will just have to be recorded in the register as it is or no caliber. But what happens if it's already registered as a Remington 700 308 and you've got a Remington 700 308, a Remington 700 223 and a Remington 700, I don't know, 7 08 and you use those three rifles to build one mm -hmm. and you have two leftover receivers. So those three rifles were previously registered. Now you've got two leftover receivers. How do you cope with that? So you've got one, you have one rifle left over and you end up with two major parts. Yeah. That's it. So the two former Can rifles. You change that? So the two former rifles would be decommissioned in one way in the system. Um, yep. recognising though that they are replaced with the two major um, parts. So okay. that's still currently in place. And then be put back into a rifle? Yep. 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 So when once it's made because it's the once you've rebuilt it, you know, into whatever it is you rebuild it into, then you just take one ring. You want to contact the registry centre and say it's now no longer a major part, it's actually a full, fully fledged firearm. And then they can do the relevant update working with your own detail. Okay, so, so, so there's, I've got to move on. So does everyone feel happy with that 
answers to no. the no. 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 Would, to, would that be manufacturing? And now you're manufacturing firearms, and now you've got to pay you know, five grand a year for your manufacturing? Unless you forged the receiver yourself, drilled it out. So assembly is not considered to be manufacturing? Yeah. Not yet to make those. Uh, there, yeah. In this instance, no. Okay. Anyone, everyone, stick up your hand if they feel happy with that answer about changing, assembling. Good. Excellent. I've got 15, 19. Okay, I think this has already been, uh, this question's already been answered. How many categories are there for major parts in the register? I believe, Mike, can you correct me if I'm wrong? You've already said receiver, upper, lower, and caliber conversion kits as well. Frame, frame as frame. well as frame. Yeah, there's only about six different things. Again, we're going to reach on our major parts. And PCCKs. With the caliber conversion kits, um, I've got a collection of German drillings, which quite often have inserts in the shotgun barrels. <coughs> are those caliber conversion kits? Do I have to individually register those? No, because they're actually considered barrels in and of themselves, and the barrel is the major firearms part. Okay. So, moving on to the next question. Sorry, go ahead. Quick, quick question. You said uppers and lowers. If those are mismatched numbers, then you just pick one again? Yep, so um, upper and lower receivers have to be uh, serialised with the same number. Um, okay. if, but if, again, if it's a collector's item, we'll work on an individual basis where it, about what that might mean. But if you can imagine the uh, former AR-15 fleet out there, yep. um, they came with, a, I think it was a lower receiver mark. Yep. Um, they would then have to have the same number put on the upper receiver so they're a matching match. If ALs had numbers on both components. Sure. And look, there's just so many firearms out there, there's going to be a whole lot of uniqueness. We get it, and um, we're happy to work with individuals around the unique things that you have and come to whatever the relevant resolution is. So okay. Are you saying that <coughs> parts of the firearm have to be, if they're registered as a, as a single firearm, both parts of the firearm have to be serial numbers? Yeah, if it's got an upper and lower receiver, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a single single firearm. Single firearm. But because they come in an upper or lower receiver configuration, they've got to have the same serial number. Can't work. If they're together, right? If there's so it's just one number. Yep. So if, so if you split them, then you would have to serialise the other way? Or are you saying they'd have to put a serial number on both parts? Okay, so we'll just treat this in two parts. You have a firearm, it's complete, it's functional, and it has an upper or lower receiver. They have to have the same serial number. What if they only have one? Yeah, hang on. The second part is, if you've got a major part, which happens to be a receiver and a lower receiver, or separately an upper receiver, and they're not a, they're they're just floating around as major parts, then yes, they need to be serialized, and no, they probably won't have the same serial number. But when they come together to make a firearm, they need to have one serial number. What if the upper doesn't have a serial number now? It needs to have one put on. Yeah. And is that the same with no, machine guns? Does one have a, a lower receiver and an upper receiver? So if it's an up, upper, uh, you know guns much better than I, Martin. Um, if it's an upper and lower receiver type firearm, then it has to have the same serial number. Okay. Um, just to check. Hold on, wait. Double serial number guns. Yeah. So just add guns. So that, that's back when you devalue your guns. Yeah. Now hang on, guys, you're forgetting. For collectible items, where there's a certain pr criteria that'll meet, we'll work with, with where the marking might be and all these sorts of things, okay? Mm. Okay, go. Okay. Well, just, just, just to quick with that, in no. the case of the upper and lower receiver being separated prior to the, the registry being enacted, and I didn't know, for instance, who had got the other part, and they were both carrying the same serial number, what is, how does the registry pick up the fact that two of us could now register? significant components, however they're both carrying the same serial number. Yeah, so one will be a lower receiver and one will be the upper receiver. And what so the that's a unique difference between a lower receiver and a trigger. Miles, control this. Uh, you know you're testing me on my gun knowledge there, mate. <laughs> I mean, most guns come in two parts, you know. Yeah, okay. I, I suppose what we still want to keep going back to is what we're trying to achieve as we try to identify the firearm. Yeah. And that's and, and well, what I'm wondering do I have to go through and stamp a top number and a bottom number on every one, nearly all of my firearms? Like a brand gun, for instance, is, is that a lower receiver when you take it apart? 
Oh, I don't know if we get well enough. Start the professional work, and start the legal system. Yeah, I mean, they're already known. Probably not on a breakdown, but if you're talking about an hour. Say in 18, it comes quietly, you've got your barrel and your part in the pipe. Yeah, that's more about that. You're right, that's more of a trigger assembly than an upper receiver lower receiver. So that's more about the upper receiver lower receiver. Yeah, you're right, that's more of a trigger assembly than an upper receiver lower receiver split. So again, we'll be willing to work with you on that to have clear understanding of what it should be. So here's an opportunity for the collective. Make a list of what you think are genuinely firearms with upper and lower receivers and those that should just be considered as a receiver and will consider it. Genuinely so. Because you know your gun's much better than I do, right? That's every one. They all have somewhat component to Whether it's a trigger or a lower or an upper, they all, that's how they work. Yep. So we want to be pragmatic about it, and as Andrew said, identify the gun. Hold on one second, David's had his hand up forever. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, another David. We've actually got a status in the firearms reference table for combination guns, right? And so, uh, majority of them will be identified generally as a shotgun first because the majority of them are combination guns. Uh, you know, drillings, for instance, the majority of them are a shotgun with a rifle, unless it's a double rifle where it just becomes a rifle. So, there's some confusing stuff out there that's hard to categorise, so we've categorised it the best we can. No. Just, just one challenge. No. Hold on, Mark. Hold on. Does that, is that, is that, is that the pistols are exempt from that? Because, I mean, they have a 1911 stop them. The firing mechanism stop the barrels, so everything else. But you're saying the only lowering, you're registering just the part of the second. 1911 doesn't have an upper and lower receiver. Okay. But so, I mean, what's the difference, though? In what way is that different? You have when when, when, when has a, nine, when has a 1911 slide ever been described as an upper receiver? No, I know, but... Well, that's the answer to your question. Okay, moving on. Rob has been waiting. Just just wait a sec, please. Rob. So is the receiver just not defined in law in the Act, or are you just using words in the regulations? Uh, this is a way It's described in the regulations and the Act as upper and lower receivers. But is upper receiver and lower receiver got a definition in the beginning of the act? No. Just because you don't call it an upper or you didn't call it an upper. Yeah. yeah. Sorry guys, we're getting a lot of domination from you guys. Have to take it all fine and work through 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 some of the detail again, which you know a lot better than, than I do around your guns. Okay? A semi automatic pistol with a with a, a slide, the slide is as uh, John said, it's not an upper receiver. Okay? Okay, so we're not. We're just going to leave that because it, it's going to be a pain in the ass. Yeah, I just no. I'll, I'll comment briefly that designation between slide and front is rather arbitrary between receivers. But um, <coughs> what I wanted to bring up, so when you you register the calibre of the firearm in the re register, correct? Okay, and you register the calibre conversion kits because obviously they can change the calibre, correct? But you're saying if I put an insert in it, which completely changes the calibre of the firearm, I don't need to register or change the calibre of the firearm to register. Uh, yeah, essentially that is correct. Okay. Then why would you take out the conversion kits? Yeah, look. Like, what, what's the point? Uh, uh, the point is, is that that is the way the legislation has been written, and that's why we've got to stand Quite more on it. Okay, guys, we've got plenty to mo go through, and I'm going to move on, all right? And this one's really important. If I dismantle my rifle for a repair or a restoration project, how long do I have to change the registration category? In other words, if my rifle that I have bought and registered as a 308 and I think, right, I'm going to do a project on it, how long do I have before I have to change the category into, say, just a review? So can I just get some clarity on that? So you're doing a project, what does that actually mean? Does that mean you've taken the barrel out of it? Does it mean you've taken the may well, May well be the barrel, it may well be doing a trigger group or whatever. But it's taken time, is what I'm saying. But it doesn't change the existence of the serial number on the receiver, does Correct. it? Correct. We don't need to know about it. We don't need to know about it. Okay, excellent. Don't need to know about it. Sorry, just <laughs> sort of that. 
I've got a couple of alternative reactions, nothing in them just actions. How do you dispose of them? Um, you can take them to the police station or you can take them to your local um, firearms dealer and ask if they want them or if they can dispose of them for you. And is that a trigger event? <coughs> no. 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 Or you could give them to Rob. <laughs> okay. Will checking someone's license status using the police app cause a trigger event? No. Are you talking about the online license checking? Yeah. Excellent. Given that many collectors have many old parts, at what point does a receiver or a frame become non registrable? <laughs> Um, I saw a really sad looking Kia gun about four weeks ago. Um, it was going to take a lot of work to make money, but that would need um, to go into the registry because it's still actually a firearm. Um, again, it's a subjective assessment by us all as to what degree of dilapidation would then render it no longer a thing of relevance. I think if you cut it in half, that would be one way to uh, yeah, render it not <coughs> Well, yeah, but actually you're not allowed to dis um, a deactivated firearm like the machine gun from that. There's no such thing as a deactivated No, firearm. you're right, there's no such thing, but John's talking about sectioning it like you'd mount it on a wood. Yeah, but sectioned firearms are, are still registered items. They're sold at auctions all the time and they're registered. I'm talking about cutting an action in half so it's not usable as an action anymore. Okay. I'm pretty sure that there's case law that says that by the repair or replacement, so if it is like a rusty piece of crap that you would never be able to get going, it would not be so Yep, so there's, some, there's even provision in the Act, I'm not sure about the case law, but um, yeah, it's anything that's uh, with parts or repair, you can make it a gun, it is a gun. Okay. Uh, relic, so a relic like something dug up from up in New Guinea. No, you can't repair it. But it's impossible to repair. It takes, you'd have to start from scratch, so it's not. Okay, we have to have a look at individual things, it's hard to say what place I'm doing. Okay, I'm, I'm really interested in this one. What provision has been made to allow the correction of mistakes when entering data? <laughs> Can we go on to our own file to rectify our own entries? And you can, no, you can get entry to touch them. You know you can't, but you call us up and we'll work, we'll work through it with you and we'll make the adjustments on it. Well, so that's example being put a zero, it should have been an O, it gets a ring. If you can't do your own stuff, how do you know you made a mistake? <laughs> at, at the point the mistakes identified as a genuine mistake, we'll work, work it out. At a certain point in time, I think will have to be a thing, right? Okay, so my next question following on to that is we have all, we're all fit and proper people, we're all looking to enter our data. I make a mistake, at what point do I become criminally liable for making that mistake? As you, as you heard Andrew said, if you've made a genuine mistake, bring the 800 number, we'll work it through and we'll make the right But how do I know that I've made, I make, I have 200 firearms. Well you don't know until you know. Yeah, do you? No, so it's, it's like any mistake you don't know until it's, it's my, a My mistake. concern is that the mistake <laughs> might be delivered. So the fact is you're fit and proper now, you're fit and proper a period of time later when the mistakes uh, happen. It's, it's my own scheme of things. Why would we be taking any particular well, negative reaction? I'll give you an example. I had an inspection recently. There was a firearm that was on my license. Um, I couldn't produce it, um, but I had sold it. I'd sold it at the, at, at, a, at the arms fair. The paperwork was processed by a police member, and the police had lost the paperwork, but the person who was doing the inspector immediately accused me of disposing of the firearm illegally. I was treated as a criminal from the get-go. Right. Well, um I'll take that face value. You have the opportunity to register all the things in, in your uh, into the registry as you're required to do under the regulations, all right? We'll work with you if there's any error in that and or any other errors and records as we work through to get to a final position in due course of having a fully populated registry. Okay. Which, because the technology platform we're building will move away from the paper uh, errors that we've had in the past. Okay, so my next question is part of that. The NIA database already has some of my registered um, items on it. It has been incorrect in past inspections. When will the police data match the NIA database with my items on the register? 
Oh, you can. Oh, okay. oh, so, um, so our new database is not taking anything from there. So everything that goes in is brand new and clean. So, and that's the whole purpose of it. That's, it. that's all totally clean. We're not losing that there information and we can still refer to it, but from, from, from the 24th onwards, everything that goes into that registry is, is clean as such. It's a more SDA's talk about data. And it's clean because you're putting it in there and then we'll do a reconciliation against the NIA holdings. So what happens if they're out? Yeah, we'll have a conversation about why is it out. Yeah. Probably down at the police station. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, remember, it's, you, want, you want to give us, this is the, there's a slight contradiction with the way it seems to be being applied because if I add all of my collection to the registry, I then have to seek permission by proving who I am to then go back into the registry so I can view what I got in. Now, if I'm having to go through those hoops yet again about being fit and proper and who am I and where do I live and where's my collection, it seems to be a massive double up on the fact that you're trying to give ownership to everybody in this room and the community, the wider community in New Zealand with their firearms, and yet by your own admission you just said that the 0800 people will be the ones that have to correct the mistakes that I made on my collection if I was to make any, by admitting that I made a mistake on a particular firearm because the serial number was transposed or it was wrong or the wrong one. Why would you not give the people in this room that you're going to vet and give that permission to by going through all of the security hoops that we'd have to go through? Why would you take that from us uh, so that your people can do that when you're actually putting the onus on us in the first place to populate your site. So the um, we're not making you jump through the hoops again around federal proper because you currently license your current endorse that doesn't change. What we are asking is because we have heard clearly from the community that around the data, uh, security and privacy security, and in order to shore that up so you can look at your things as we need you to come to the police station as a once only activity, undertake the verification process and then you'll be able to look <coughs> on it. But just by virtue of owning a firearms license with collector endorsements, prohibited endorsements, shouldn't that already be a vehicle to give me the kind of clearance that I already need without having to go to a police station with my passport, which is currently not, I don't have one, with my firearms license, with any kind of form of ID? Yep, one form of ID, yep. Yeah, but I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is I've already done that. And by virtue of me populating your registry or the registry that's going to take the firearms, why do we have to do that again? Because we want, so you can go back and have a look at the registry, you need to do it. But I'm not able to go and do that until I've actually got that proof again of who I actually am. And yet I'm the one who just loaded all of that information into the registry. Okay, we're going to go around the circle, so I'm going to end it there because this next question, I need you to think about it carefully and give me a show of hands. So the next question is, what provision has been made for an extension of time for collectors with large numbers of items who simply cannot complete the register within the 30-day time period? Now, I know Mike has already touched upon this, but I'm going to give him some real feedback here. How many people in this room feel that due to the size of their collection and the fact that they have work commitments or whatever else, they will not be able to do the... Um, whole registry bit in 30 days. Can I have a show of hands please? Especially if you've got a double stamp everything. <laughs> how many how many people if a show of hands please, how many people have uh, your own manual records either written down or on a computer or something of what you uh, what you own? And in most cases would that include the make model, uh, caliber, that sort of stuff? No. Or if it doesn't at least you've got it in your head. Yeah. Yep, then it should be a pretty straightforward process. It's on paper. Other other than the volume. It's on paper. It's on paper. How's that going to save me time? Because you don't have to go every second. You're just unplugging it. Stuart. But, but one or two complicating events for collectors with large collections is that they might have Turkish collections with Farsi conversions mm -hmm. needed, Cyrillic on Russian sort of things. So you know there are there are there are lots of add-ons that yep. sort of make the thirty days. Pretty, pretty. Okay, so now I'm going to ask the question, so, okay, what's the, so what's this, the real process? process has been, um, so you're aware of the 30-day requirement, right? 
I've said that we have made a genuine and bulk effort to get them, uh, get them most of it in. We'll be, we'll be given an extension. Recognising that on Saturday week, you're not all going to have an activated circumstance on that day. Yes, we in many cases, it could be. <laughs> Is there an option on the 2nd of July? July. Okay, well, if you buy something in that the show, you have permits to possess and you buy an income. Folks, you're now aware of it, start tripping. It just probably doesn't work like that, John. Come on. Don't be silly. I'm a collector. We'll just stop breathing then. I want to know about the process. This is important. I want to know what process we do for an application for extra time. Mike's mentioned it, he said it's available, I've heard nothing about the process. So that would, that would live in my space, so what, what would happen is, and Mike said, I mean, the, the bar, I assume that the vast majority of your collection wouldn't be like that, the vast majority of your collection you should be able to enter quite comfortably, and if we can see that you've made an honest attempt to get all that in, and the problem is you can't get it in because it's in passing, or some, some little thing that we need to change, that's when you ring us up, we have that conversation, and we see how we can... So it's a conversation, it's not a process, it's though. Still, That's the scary well, it thing. Process, it, uh, we, we, so, a commissioned officer or police, such as Andrew, can issue the extension, and they'll be followed up and by as an email. Okay, it's so it's I, I, need one, I need one thing to be perfectly clear here. I've got a case of a collector who is sitting in this room at the moment who has a large collection, who it works very hard, his items are over a 1,000, he can't do it in 30 days. Does he go and speak to you now and say, I need to get my registered home and have an activating circumstance the day after registration comes in? How does that work? What, I mean, so I'd like to provide some clarity. When you have an activated circumstance, you have an obligation to start the registration process. You know how many guns you've got. If you've got a large collection, <laughs> start doing some preparation now to get you further along the track. There is provision in the regulations for an extension. We are articulating that we have made a genuine attempt to get through um, you know, the bulk of your holdings. If you've got someone like a thousand, a thousand things, yeah, 30 days certainly won't be enough. We want the registry to be successful. A one time only registration process. Once it's done, it's done. If we have to give you an extension so that you're successful in completing the registration process, we will give it to you. If you've got five things in your collection, you're very highly unlikely to get an extension unless you have to be overseas for 29 of those days or something like that. But Mike, with respect, I don't think you understand because you said, oh, if you've got it all written down somewhere or if you've got it in a spreadsheet or something, it's still a manual process, line by line by line by line for a thousand items. I get it. Can I answer that question? So I'm collecting two. So I had all my firearms that I own written down, a serial number, make model serial number, caliber, right? I had that written down now. For insurance purposes. Yeah. Right. I've had a chance to play in the registry already, right? Because obviously um, I work for uh, Detail Group, right? It takes me roughly uh, to enter one firearm detail, right? Once I've entered who I am and so on, it takes me roughly two and a half minutes to enter a firearm. That's you. Have a look at the, who's here. There's guys yeah. here who don't even have computers. So now you're going to have them sitting on the phone registering a thousand and, items. And you've got to remember, you don't have any load on your system yet. Second you get load, your system's going to slow down. It's going to shit itself. So guys, there are activating circumstances. There is a time window. There is the ability for an extension where it's appropriate. That is the key message you need to take away. You don't necessarily need to like it. You do need to understand we will work with you on an individual basis as is relevant to you and your holdings and the type of firearms. It's new for us all. We want you to be successful. We want the registry to be successful. We are here tonight as part of a demonstration around that. Okay? We are not going to please everybody. I get it. Some of the antagonism at the moment is a little bit annoying. And you probably feel the same way. I get it. We are here to pass key information, okay? Go. Is a license renewal an activating circumstance? Yes. yes, it is. Okay, moving on. Do people feel that they question about getting an extension if you've run out of time in 30 days? Do people feel that question has been answered? Let's have a hand show of hands. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Yep, that was a much better one. If after the 30-day period, 
we realise we have inadvertently missed some items, can we register them and will there be a penalty? Well, the answer is yes, you can. Um, it would come down to circumstances. So, is there a penalty? No, because you're trying to do the right thing because you found it, so you've got something else. However, I'd be a bit surprised um, if there was a long trail of things that kept getting found. Be careful. <laughs> Every week bringing Andrew's team saying, oh, I found something else. There's a com probably a conversation about your security or fit or proper or something like that. Okay? You can have a box of parts that are completely useless that you've got to register. I just said on a, yeah. Okay, moving on. What allowances are made for the significant percentage of firearms owners who may suffer from a disability? And we're talking not only um, deafness, blindness, and lack of computer skills, but we're talking dyslexia or dyscalculia, and that may prevent them from recording something accurately. So there's a massive opportunity in the cohort that you have here to support each other, and in certain circumstances where you're struggling, ring Andrew's team. <laughs> yes. Just one, one question, what happens if Andrew's team gets it wrong? We get prosecuted. Oh, I, I don't know where you take this. Oh, okay. oh. I mean, because we're human, um, we make mistakes. There's going to be there's humans in Andrew's team. They're yeah, going to make mistakes. Absolutely. And, and it's on us to make sure. Yep. And we will make we will work with you to make sure the registry is right. You'll work with us to make sure the registry is right. We'll get to a point of agreement at a point in time. Okay. So the next question, I think I'll move on. Existing police records of existing registered items have been proven to contain many errors. What steps have been undertaken to ensure that the firearms licence holder is not held responsible for NIA errors and any ongoing errors not of their making? Yep, so, so we accept that some of our records aren't ideal and see probably these other places and some of you maybe not necessarily have the right records as well. However, we want the registry to be successful. We will work with you to make it successful. We will certainly do a reconciliation against the NIA holders. In the scenario where there's something not there or whatever it might be, we'll work with you about what might have happened to it. And on a case by case basis, we'll, we'll figure it out. Can I, can I just add to that? Um, back in the days when we had MSSAs, and I had a lot of them, I had issues with some of my records. I went down, I sat down with my arms officer, and we went through it. Where I said, look, I sold it to this guy here, and I did this with it, and that. And my arms officer said, yeah, that's fine. Uh, made phone calls, I made phone calls, and we sorted it all out. It happened on a couple of occasions, right? Never once did I have an issue with my arms officers, because I went in there, open and honest, and said, you know, this is what I think's happened. And I don't see why that would change going forward. Okay, cool. Do people feel that's answered the questions? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, the next question is, can a collector submit a written list of their collection in the correct format to the local arms office for registration within the 30 days? No. That's pretty clear. No. Yep. So the reason for that, we've set up two deliberate uh, registry teams who are skilled in doing what they need to or develop the skill set they need to be uh, successful in the registry. We need the arms officers to be left alone carrying on the licensing and endorsement processes and stuff like that. Okay, so there's deliberate work groups doing deliberate activity. As soon as we divert one work group to another activity, something else slows down. Does that make sense? Yep. Do people feel that's answered the question? Cool. Noel, I can see you. Yes, what about somebody who hasn't got a computer? Get Andrew's team oh, okay. What happens I'm, if I'm what happens if I will talk to me, but I'm actually I'm, I'm looking around this room, I see young faces, I see old faces. I'm sure you've got sons, daughters, nieces, nephews on that. Reach out. Get people to help you if you can't do it. Right? I know I'm going to be helping another collector who will remain nameless in Wellington who's not very good on this stuff. I know I'm going to be helping him when he has to do this. Right? And it won't be that tricky. I know he's got over 100 firearms, but he has got them all written down. He's good at that. Right? Well, you're really responsible for email in there over here. Well, I'm helping them. I'm helping them as part of Tari Piriki. I'm helping them as John Herbert. Right? So if I make an error, yeah, I'll make an error. But I don't, I'm not too worried about that because if I do make an error, it will be an honest mistake. 
right? And if there is an honest mistake, it will be cleared up by having the conversation. Okay. Will I be able to correct the error when I'm going to run this in this other other number unknown? Will I solve it on the other day? Yes, for the for the officers. Yeah. Not quite sure where you go on that, Greg. Well, there's, there's, there's poor descriptions right through it, right? Yeah. It's terrible. What, what I said when I'm seeing printouts of them, right? So, and when I'm trying to correct stuff and say, hey, you've got a a Morza 9mm. Turns out it's a Luger, right? If someone was clever and wrote, you know, Morza instead of BYU, you know, just German Luger POA, right? And that's, that's a simple one, right, that you can't find. But then un they don't know what it is. And it goes in as unknown, unknown, caliber unknown. So, so by you entering everything into the registry yourself. No, not me. Somebody else that's no, no, no. Going forward, I'm talking about, not what's happened historically. Going forward, when you enter all that stuff in there, it's not going to be other and other, other, because you know what you're going to be entering. No, no, I'm not talking about me entering that. I'm talking about I then, then it comes into my position. Yeah. Will we be able to change four descriptions? Uh, yeah, with the phone, with the, with the phone number to 0800, you'd start a conversation. Yeah. Oh, conversation. Well, everything has to start with a conversation, yeah. right? Because there's so many. Because I've tried for years to get it changed. I felt like, yeah, you could tell me that we've tried to change stuff in there for years and it hasn't been changed. Mm -hmm. I've said, oh, this is this. You need to change it to that. It's wrong. And it never happens. As I spoke a couple of minutes ago with one of the errors of mine, it was a description error, mm -hmm. right? Someone had. I had it as an AR-15 and someone had decided to call it a Colt. That's why they couldn't find it, right? Because, as you know, AR-15 collectors, initially they were called Colts, not AR-15s. And, and whoever did the input there decided to call it that. A conversation was had with my arms officer and we resolved it that way. And that will be that be the way it's going to have to go going forward. Guys, but there are so many different scenarios that could happen. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you guys have to leave at nine, so I'm going. To, we're going to get through these questions, whether we like it or not. And the next one is: Will there be any charges introduced for registration in the future? There's no charges for uh, entering things in the registry. There's no charge for operating in the registry. That's the decisions of government, and as articulated uh, in the regulations. Excellent. Everyone feel that question's been answered? Yeah. Hands up. Cool. Next one. The question was in the future. Though. Yes. Well, I can't tell you what governments in the future are going to do. Yeah. Well, this is an yeah. operational can matter, and they should be in charge of it. Next week, please. <laughs> hey, moving on, moving on. I don't want you to be wasting time. Uh, what is the police procedure for notifying all licensed firearms owners of data breaches? Uh, so, if there's a cyber attack or a hacking event, what's the procedure? One of the opportunities with the registry is that. Um, it will give us functionality such as if we end up with 240,000 email addresses because there's 240,000 license holders, uh, one of the me methods that we would do any notification for uh, is through the email chain. We also have functionality in due course that will probably be able to send text messages. Certainly we have uh, snail mail, we have public notifications and all sorts depending on what the uh, circumstances uh, it is. At the moment, uh, so we have 240,000 license holders, we hold about 160,000 email addresses. So about 160,000 license holders have been given uh, email progressive um, bits of information as we're built towards, you know, registry going live, you know, it's coming all this uh, and the like. So there's great opportunities with the new technology around other and, and enhancing existing um, information dissemination. Okay. So I think it's hard. Will we be notified right away? Yep, well, if there's a big attack, um, I think a lot of people will know about it. Yeah, we want to know first, though. <laughs> uh, just to backtrack one question, the 0800 number to start a conversation, will there also be an email number or an email address <coughs> where we can start the conversation? No, we don't want that. that that's a stage it'll be uh, it'll be via um there'll be uh, we we will have an inward email but not an external email. So you, it's a conversation with us or it's online. So otherwise we'll end up with the lanes galore. Uh, so we we've made a conscious decision that there's only going to be two ways of registering your firearms. 
and, and that's and that's just for efficiency. I've got to move on, guys. I've got to move on. What allowances for extra time, meaning extra time over the 30 days, have been made if the system crashes partway through data entry or we have got serious IT professionals in the room, had it performs poorly under load? Yeah, so if there's an error like or an issue like that, obviously it's not your fault or we'll work with you to, um, uh, you certainly won't be held accountable for things that are outside of your control. Okay, do people feel that's answered the question? Let's have a look. Cool. And the next question from one of our members, given the politicians have allowed five years to register, why is there a 30 day time limit imposed by the police regulation? It's not police regulations, it's, a, it's regulations of government um, and that if there's an activating circumstance, you've got that time frame to uh, do your registration for us to as well. Cool. Do people feel that's answered the question? Let's have a show of hands. Cool. Are the Firearms Safety Authority registry staff vetted to a similar level as firearms licence holders? <laughs> All of our staff are vetted through the initial employment process, which is probably broadly similar, um, and then they have um, uh, ongoing, you know, do the relevant uh, assurance test um, check. With quality assurance checks over the top of that as well. Okay, this one's for Andrew. Have any steps been taken to ensure consistency of interpretations of registration advice between arms officers? Yeah, well, so that, that's a, again that quality assurance. So we've got, we're building quality assurance processes over everything we do, so we can so we get a consistent standard across the board. Um, you know, we have so we have two registries as such, that we can, but we do everything together, and those and that we're really conscious of that. And, and obviously, it's a new thing, um, but we, that's the whole point of the quality assurance. So if we see something's not working well, we can fix it and, and make it work better. So your local arms officer is not an expert on registry, they know enough. The team that you need to speak to around registry matters is in Auckland and Wellington, there's two teams and that's delivered as Andrew just said. Okay, cool. Does everyone feel that's answered the question? Okay, go. Uh, quick question about the OL100 number. Um, are the officers at the other end obliged to identify themselves? And should you ask for that identity? Yes. Yes, they should be identified themselves. Yeah, are they um, So, just so you know, um, all calls are recorded and then you'll be notified of that when you're making that call. So we'll know who had that conversation with them. Yeah, but what There's I'm, no obligation for them to say who you are. But then if, if it sees an issue, um, then it can be raised. Remember, there's only <coughs> uh, 80 of us in the in the whole country that will be doing it. Yeah, but if I end up talking to five or six different people and, and I get five or six different answers, uh, I'm going to be up shit crack, aren't I? Yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I mean... So are they obliged to identify, like a police officer? Like a police officer, officer I suppose. Hey, that's a good question. Um, and and I'll, I'll have a conversation with um, with the team about that. That's a good question that we can do as well. Reference the reference will always be your license number. So any task. I'm talking about yeah, but if you have a query about what happened with that conversation with that person, there'll be there'll, that'll be a log against that person's name. And okay. You, and you'll so your firearms license, they'll have a conversation that gets logged. So that whoever logs that, we know who you've been speaking okay, to. Okay, still didn't answer the question. Are they obliged to identify themselves or not? I don't know, and I and what's the purpose anyway? Because I've just explained that if we needed to identify who you spoke to, we can. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm, this one's a particularly um, one close to my heart because I see it in the business at SAI we're in. How will previously unregistered items? be entered into the register. In particular, will P prohibited magazines and firearms be able to be registered? Yes. So P, so for example, if I had a collector ask me, I'm going to take all the stuff out of my safe and I'm going to go through it to check the fire, firearms serial number. What happens if I discover a P magazine? What's the procedure? Oh, I see, you discover something that's not already registered? Correct. 
We'll deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. You obviously need a permit to possess that particular thing. If you discover, say, an M16 magazine, you're highly unlikely to be able to keep it because there's plenty of them already, and especially if you've already got one for the particular firearm that takes that magazine. However, if it's something particularly unique, and there's very few of them, and you don't have one for the gun that you have, and just whatever reason fell in the wherever it fell, um, then there's more of a probability that you might get to keep it. Okay, does, do people feel that's answered the question, hands up? Cool. Okay, should it occur, what are the consequences for criminals found with a hacked shopping list of firearms that has been lifted from the register? <laughs> it's happened in Australia, Mike, so we've got members here who are from Australia, and that's what's happened over there. Yeah, well obviously criminals with information they shouldn't have is an offence in itself. Um, if they undertake criminal activity, well, they'll be doubtful of those sorts of things. That obviously begs the question where the information comes from and there's an inquiry around that. Okay, my next question is, older collectors, I have seen um, not one, two or three, I've had six instances of older collectors who have reported to me that they have been bullied into giving up their endorsements. And I'd just like you to... Yeah, well, in a case, I, I'm standing to hear that, but if you want to give me specific details, we'll have that looked at, but... Um, I've had six collectors. Um, the rea the there's no requirement for you to give up your licence. There's no requirement for you to give up your endorsement. There is a place for firearms in New Zealand. You are fit and proper people. You can carry on doing what you're doing. Perfect. Thank you. People feel okay. that's answered the question? Excellent. Okay, so perhaps something for John. What rules will be applied to firearms, in particular restricted firearms, at public displays and reenactments? So I am in the process of writing a guidance document called Reenactors. Um, and the guidance document will have a focus on security, on planning, and understanding the responsibilities of the armourer and or head armourer on the day of the reenactment. Uh, question, do you do any reenacting? No, I don't. So how but we we've been working closely with reenacting. Good mate of mine, Steve Goodman. And Steve Goodman has been guiding me on this. Excellent. Do we... what, what about uh, taking a restricted firearm to a firearm's gun show to display it? There's provision, I think, already in your endorsement to allow that to happen, from memory. Kevin? Yeah. Yep. Does that have anything to do with it? No, a permit to carry is a different thing again. Can you explain what the permit A permit to carry is something outside the existing conditions of, of your endorsement. So most endorsements you should have an endorsement to carry, and it will, just like a pistol club member, they can take it to an range, yeah. to a dealer, to uh, an armourer, and likewise with a collector, you can take it to an organised event. For example, a club evening here. Correct. Yep. So um, as an example, we can put conditions on licences and endorsements. So for a particular reason, we might say you can have this license and this endorsement, but here's the particular conditions. If one of them was that this thing can never leave this particular location, then if that person wanted to have that considered uh, to leave that location, um, they'd have to go and get the uh, relevant uh, condition lifted or get the permit to carry type um, thing in force. So uh, does, does the P, can we still bring, uh, bring a P item into display at our... It's a collectible item. item. Yep. Fantastic. So the answer is yes. Yeah, you've got to have the right security provisions. You come from your secure location to this location directly back, all those sorts of things. Kevin, yeah. yeah. that's exactly right. No different to any other firearm. Security of the firearm in your vehicle must be correct, right? Bolt out, things like that. Okay. I need to ask this one because it's important and perhaps Kevin can help. Will the new register do away with the need for permits to possess for restricted or prohibited items? For example, every item that I own, whether restricted or prohibited, is now on the register. Every item that you own is on the register. If I sell my pistol to you and I check your licence and you've got a C licence or a B licence, why is there, is there going to be a need for that paperwork? Well, there will be because you don't know under the, the conditions with which you hold that C endorsement. So the reason my, my collectible interest 
and what I've, I've described is my collective interest could be different to yours, I don't know. There'll always need to be human intervention, just like um, between bees. Probably that's a little bit more, we've had that discussion before. If it's a bee cat firearm and you're a bee cat holder and it's already registered as a bee cat, but if you want to move a bee cat to a sea cat, clearly you can't just turn around and do that. We, we, there has to be human intervention. Unfortunately, computers don't have the ability to carry out that structure. It's a, so in, I go, in, so I'm a sea cat to you, you're a sea cat, sea cat to sea cat. I need to have a look to decide whether or not it fits within has displayed collectible interest. Um, if not, then you'll have to supply well, That's an interesting point that you raise because display of collectible interest isn't even in the legislation. Neither is a description of what a bona fide collector is. And now you're making a, a judgment based on something that's not even in the legislation. There's a requirement in the legislation for the pimp to possess that exists. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we will still have to have permits to possess. Yeah. Okay, David. <laughs> Right now, is there, we go registry of the firearms with the uh, guns in the C1 and guns in the C4. Is there things to, is there, is it like, is it different? Like, we, we register them? Like, is it, you register one as the general? So you, you, don't, you don't have to register it by way of category and law. You just have, so you, you go in and there's uh, seven things, I think it is. So you have to say what type of firearm it is, say a pistol, uh, the make, the model, the action, the caliber, the serial number and whether it has a detachable magazine <coughs> or not. And if it has a fixed magazine, what's the capacity? What if you don't know the capacity? Like, you know it's going to be under 10, right? But is it an 8? Is it 9? Does it really matter? Because there's plenty of old guns that are really difficult to tell without, we're not even an ammunition for it or. Sure. Yeah. You know, just make it just guess. Well, I mean, there'll be, there'll be material available that should guide you. There's plenty of online stuff, as you probably know better than me, about will give you an indicator of probably what it is. Call a friend. Yeah. I think have a conversation. to do with trust and respect, and a lot of us, we have um, suffered a lot of problems with the um, police over the past. What are you doing personally, Mike, to build mm. the trust and respect back with firearms owners? Yeah, so the starting point is um, there's a whole lot of things, as we all know from history. If we're going to keep looking back, you're going to be continue being a grumpy, cups half full crowd. The opportunity is to work with it's us different. as we build our workforce <laughs> knowledge and skill set, because we will probably never know guns as well as you lot do, okay? Because, you know, we're, we're delivering Toyota mechanics, and you guys are like Ferrari mechanics, okay? So you need to help us understand the Ferrari. If you ring up, yeah, I see the shaking of a few heads. Get over yourself, okay? It's, it's the tone that's not helping, to be honest. Well, I'm just saying, you're yeah, coming but, across very aggressive. We're sitting there, we're feeding off each other. Yep. It's not the best, it's not the best look. Well, excuse me for that. We want to go forward, folks. We're here now, I'm here now, it's the second time I've been here. I appreciate it was three or four years ago that I was here last, mm -hmm. all right? We want to make the registry successful. We want you to be successful in the registry. It's a one-time only opportunity. Uh, activity, sorry. And my last question has to do with politics. If the election happens and there's a change of government and the government makes a ruling, how it, it, and says, right, we are going to do away with the registry, what's going to happen to our data? There's decisions of government. I can't speak to decisions of future government. Nobody knows. There will always be a requirement for a registry no, based aren't. on the existing law. Okay, cool. Now, listen, I've got time for a couple of quick questions. Mike has said he has to go at nine. So the reason we have to go at nine is we uh, have worked much of today and we're due in Hamilton tonight. Yeah, so. Um I decided I wanted to get ahead of the curve and I start entering my data as of next Saturday. Does that prove my 30 days? No. Cool. Well, uh, antique black powder firearms. That An antiques are not required in the registry? Well, what's, uh, what is uh, deemed an antique? Uh, anything pre 1899 that doesn't fire a cartridge type of fire or center fire cartridge. Thank you. R room fire or center Okay, Stuart. 
a lot of collectors have lent to Wairuru Museum and to Papa, and <laughs> that's going to be anticipated for a little longer than 30 days, and in some cases that's going to be years. Um, is this where the possession thing comes yep. in? Yeah. Yep. So the license, license holder at the museum will be required to register those things when there's the relevant activated circumstance for that um, museum. Oh. So, so am I as the owner rather than the possessor, the one that's got to see this as an event or? No, no. So it's, it's all about possession, not ownership. So no, it's not a triggering event. That's right. clear. Okay. Okay. okay, go. Okay, so based on that, a lot of us here have either got um, key components of firearms because of the requirements um, to hold those, or we've given parts to other people. Those people are now in possession of them. I'm now in possession of somebody else's part. And it may be, it may be a firing pin. How is that going to be treated? A, a firearm, complete, a major part, of, and permanent magazines as an example, the things that are required to go into the registry. Other little bits? Triggers, firing pins, barrels are of no interest. In the so the firing pin that I've got of Miles's semi-automatic that's required to, for him to keep it separate with me, I don't have to re record his firing pin. No. no. Okay. okay. It's moving on, Strip. Yes, you're going to have an 0800 contact number. Given, given that there's generally a bit of a wait. To, for someone to pick up. Do you have any uh, internal guidelines on what length the what the length of an acceptable wait before the phone is answered? Uh, yeah. Well, we want to provide the best service possible. All right. There's a whole lot we don't know what call demand is going to be. Great. Okay. Yeah. We really just don't know. Um, but there's. Going off data from other call centres, um, you know, we're aiming for around the three minute mark um, that, that they can pick up. Um, but we just don't know what the, we, we just don't know what it's going to be. Two more questions, Kevin. Yes, someone like myself has got a D, a C, theatrical C, and a lot of guns. When I choose the time to register them, do I make the decision of what I want them to go on? In other words, I've got a lot of guns that are theatrical guns, say 10 or 12 303s. Can I then put that on my D and put them on my C? If I've got something on my C, uh, uh, on my D, that I've decided now that I like and I've been in love with for years and I want to now register as my C, the, uh, my C collector. Do I make that decision then, or who makes that decision? Yeah, so that's a really good question, and um, I hadn't uh, thought about answering that preemptively. But yes, you need to, if you do hold a standard license with a number of endorsements, and over here you hold a dealer license and a number of endorsements, you need to clearly uh, artic or register them under the relevant license. But can you swap this from this dealer's license to that yep. collector's license? Yep, Sub subject to the relevant. Um, Would you need a permit? Thing to say? Yeah. yeah. So yes. you need a permit or could you just move it? Yeah. Uh, probably if you think well. Mm. Actually you probably need a permit to be fair Greg because um, that trend, that's between, yeah. yeah. That's an interesting one because it's between the same person but it's under two different licences. Yeah. So you can still want the permit because the arms officer will want to know why that's happening. Yeah. Right? Because so what comes through is the check them on the air. Yeah, tricky eh? <laughs> yeah. Kevin, oh my God. The, the, opportunity, the opportunity you have at the moment, sir, is that you can make some decisions where you want them to sit initially, yeah. and, and you've got time now to make that, that, have that thinking and make that decision. You're the last question. Yeah, I've got a bit of fire up, especially with the apple sense. How long can we have to put the parts in our position before that becomes an issue? Uh, you mean in context of ha requiring having the vital parts stored separately? Yeah. yeah. So, for instance, I've just got back from dealing with course in Trenton and Wellington. Yeah. Uh, if I'm holding some of the parts and there's a reenactment on the way, can I give them the parts five weeks before the event? No. So how how long can they have them? Two days. So if you're going away in a scenario like that, um, you should make and, and they would anticipate that they would probably know that that event's coming. There needs to be some interim arrangement because you can't leave them with the vital parts for that extended period of time in that particular scenario. Is, is there 
There's no exact date or time. Um, it would be what's reasonable based on the circumstances. And the circumstances, and there could be a whole lot of different circumstances, would help us all understand what that would be reasonable. So an independent person, if they looked at it, was that reasonable for this length of time for that vital part to be with that gun, creating a, a risk if it got into the wrong hands? Okay. I'm sorry, that's all the time we've got. I'd like to thank Mike, Andrew, I'd also like to thank John and Kevin. We've had a really good evening. I hope you feel that you've had at least some of your questions answered. The next step is going to be the preparation of a transcript. I'll get that checked off with Mike, and then we will share that transcript with everyone, okay? So unfortunately, Mike and co have got to drive down to Hamilton. So, um, we're, a, we're a field day tomorrow, do you want to come and have a look? More more. <laughs> doing, the, doing the fencing um, competition, so I can hear that. Um, thanks, thanks for the opportunity uh, to be here. Um, look, go, go and have a look on our website, there's a comprehensive amount of information. Um, you're, you are part of 7,500 people in New Zealand who have one or more endorsements. Um, you know, you've got a whole lot of, whole lot of uh, pretty neat stuff from some of the stuff I've seen around the country in different uh, collections. We want the registry to be successful, we want you to be successful in the registry. It's new for us as well, okay? Collectively we'll get there. Okay, thank you very much Mike and to you.